when we get to a point where the productive power produced by capitalism is so great that we could actually produce most things that people need or all things that people need and maybe a lot of things people want. But if that productive power is entirely in the hands of capitalists who want to utilize it only for profit, we're going to have a problem, right? And um, either we're going to have socialism, that is where productive power is socially owned and used to meet social needs, or we're going to have barbarism, that is where the capitalist class uses brute force to protect its control of productive power and, um, and the rest of humanity be damned. Um, and sad to say, I think that diagnosis was probably correct. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 97. And this episode is with Brian Leiter, who in the world of academic philosophy absolutely doesn't need an introduction. But Brian is Carl N. Llewellyn, Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of Chicago Law School. He is founder and director of Chicago Center for Law, Philosophy, and Human Values, and is probably best known for his philosophical work on Nietzsche and legal philosophy. But furthermore, he is the founding editor of the Routledge Philosophers book series, Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Law, and Philosophical Gourmet Report, which is the canonical and also extremely helpful and illuminating ranking of philosophy departments and PhD programs in the English-speaking world. He also, of course, maintains the world's most popular philosophy blog, Lighter Report. So in this episode, Brian and I talk about Karl Marx and a current book he's co-writing with Jamie Edwards for the Routledge Philosophers book series that I just mentioned. And of course, I mean, this episode is just over an hour and Marx is a vast figure. So naturally, we don't touch on anything approaching all of his work, but we do get into some of the basics of ideology, his critique of capitalism and exploitation. So I also want to say that Marx is a polarizing figure and he's one who's very stigmatized, at least in the U.S., and I imagine that a great deal of that stigma comes from lingering vestiges of the Red Scare that our parents and grandparents grew up with. And then at least for my generation, his association with uh, pretentious intellectualism, uh, whether that is the case or not, I guess I, I leave up to you. But there was definitely and regrettably a point in my life when not even knowing a thing about Marx, I would have derided anyone who studied him. And this really isn't to my credit at all. But what I think is important here, or at least what I would wish for you, my geeselings, is that in listening to Brian, you be open minded. So I have the sense personally that like some other books I've read in the past, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins comes to mind. Seeing the world in this Marxist way, or at least being aware of Marxist perspective, is already going to, I mean, it is, it's already doing this, but it's going to enrich my understanding of the way that the world works in a way that I wouldn't have had access to if I hadn't gotten over these preconceptions that I have. And I mean, I still, of course, totally love money and want way, way, way more of it and don't want a revolution anytime soon. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something powerful in taking seriously the flaws of capitalism or Marx's conception of class warfare and, and ideology. But in this same vein, while we're talking, uh, Brian brings up an email he received from a Florida professor who worries that he won't be able to teach Marx in his intro philosophy class anymore. And I think that this is horrible, even if I'm not a Marxist, in the same way that I think it would be horrible if this professor couldn't teach Ayn Rand or Adam Smith or someone who might be conceived as being quite on the conservative side of things, opposite Marx. And of course, 
I don't want to trivialize the distinction between teaching even handedly and indoctrinating or brainwashing because these are different things. And I don't want to suggest that that isn't a serious issue for all educators, but having the privilege and then taking advantage of the ability to listen, to learn, to understand and compare, even if you totally disagree with Marx uh, or some other thinker, is the way that we move forward as thinkers and scholars and listeners to this podcast. And I guess on a final note, I hope that you, my geeselings, will keep this in mind for future episodes as we wade into more controversial waters. So a few links are in the description to Brian's website, uh, Brian's Twitter, uh, the Lighter Reports blog, and then his most recent book, Moral Psychology with Nietzsche. And I should mention that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes, these are endlessly appreciated. Then I have Robinson Eats on Twitch and YouTube in case you want to talk to me for some reason while I eat ice cream, uh, typically in the morning, trying to move that uh, to later in the day. And now, I guess without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Brian. Just a glance at your Wikipedia page shows a couple of things. One, uh, a review in Notre Dame Philosophical Reviews named you one of the most influential legal philosophers of our time. And then another in the Journal of Nietzsche Studies called your book Nietzsche on Morality, arguably the most important book on Nietzsche's philosophy in the past 20 years. And... I'm surprised well, if there's been... anything accurate on Wikipedia these days. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, but what I'm wondering is where and how, I mean, given that your primary focuses have been jurisprudence in Nietzsche, did Marx come into your life and research? Ah, okay. Um, yes, I was always interested in Marx from, uh, from my undergraduate uh, years, which is also when I first encountered um Nietzsche, and actually, I may have read them both in the same class with Richard Rorty, <laughs> hmm. um, who taught a class called Kant to 1900, where he covered uh, Kant, Fichte, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and William James. <laughs> hmm. And um, uh, but then I had a Chris McMahon, a political philosopher who was an assistant professor then, taught a very nice course on social philosophy when I was an undergraduate that included quite a bit of Marx. So I always had a, an interest in Marx, and I did some work in graduate school, um, and I've taught Marx at the graduate level um, off and on for, for many years, but I hadn't done that much writing on Marx. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, and I edit this series, the Rutledge Philosophers book series, and uh, we had wanted, obviously, to have a volume on Marx. Twenty some years ago, I asked uh, G.A. Cohen. He wasn't interested. I asked Alan Wood. He wanted to do the Kant volume, but I'd already commissioned Paul Geyer. Um, you know, we tried various people, but nobody was interested. And I didn't feel I was deeply immersed enough in the secondary literature to do it myself. And it was also the early years of the series. I didn't really feel I wanted to, you know, come in at, at that point. Um, but then, uh, you know, here it is now. The series is 20 years on, and we still didn't have Marx. Um, and then I was working with uh, this fellow, Jamie Edwards, my co-author on the forthcoming right. book. And he wrote a very nice dissertation on um, Marx's concept of ideology and sort of the the micro foundations of the theory of ideology, right? That is, what are the psychological mechanisms by which people make certain kinds of systematic mistakes about their interests and so on? Um, but he, he was really deeply immersed in the secondary literature, and and he had you know worked with all the primary texts. So I suggested to him that we do it together, and I think that was uh, happily he agreed, and I think that was a wise choice on my part. Um, because, uh, as I say, I think on my own, I wouldn't, 
uh, wouldn't have been able to do as satisfactory a job as, as we're able to do working on this together. So, um, and, uh, you know, I suppose I always, uh, you know, had some political, uh, my political sympathies ran to the, uh, to the left. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, that naturally leads you into Marx as the, the premier, you know, critic of, uh, of capitalism, uh, in modernity. So, mm -hmm. Well, before we get into the, the text itself, I'm just curious about how you see it. Is it more just an account of Marx's philosophical beliefs, or is it meant to be an introduction to, to Marx, more broadly speaking, for people like me who aren't as familiar as we should be with his writings? Um, it's more the latter. I mean, the goal of all the books in this series is to provide sort of a, a high level or demanding introduction to major figures in the history of philosophy very broadly construed. I mean, we've had volumes on Darwin, volume on Einstein, for example, uh, mm -hmm. volume on Freud. Um, <clears throat> so it's a capacious conception, including thinkers who aren't strictly philosophers, but have had a lot of influence on philosophy, like Einstein and Darwin. Um, <clears throat> so it's supposed to be a high level introduction, meaning, you know, for advanced undergraduates, graduate students who don't work on this topic. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm hopeful there's a lot of stuff that's in there that will be of interest, um, actually to people who are specialists. Um, cause we do take, uh, some, uh, distinct positions on a number of interpretive issues where there has been controversy, though we try to confine, um, that kind of scholarly debate to footnotes. Since again, the goal is for the text to orient um, somebody who has some familiarity with Marx, but really needs some guidance and you know an introduction to the main themes of his thought. And Marx is a thinker, you know, who of course he comes out of philosophy. I mean, he writes a dissertation on ancient Greek philosophy, and he was very involved for a period of time with Hegel, the study of Hegel's philosophy and the Young Hegelians. Um, but then he has a kind of serious break from philosophy and from the philosophical tradition. Um, and, you know, so he's a, he's sort of in, we might say in our terms, he's a kind of, you know, proto-naturalist uh, where the lines between philosophy and empirical science get blurred. Um, and, uh, and so there's an enormous amount of empirical content, you know, historical and economic, um, that's, you know, absolutely essential to his thought. Hmm. Well, you've mentioned uh, two things already in particular that have me curious. And one is Jamie's thesis on ideology and mm -hmm. how people make these systematic mistakes in uh, judging their interests. And the second is Marx's break with Hegel. But I think we'll get back to those. And for now, we can we can start with the material I looked at uh, in its order and presentation in the book. And so I take it from your chapter on historical materialism that Marx's key contribution to the study of history is his observation and, and analysis that changes in society are propagated by changes in economics. Is this roughly correct? That's roughly correct. I mean, there's, there's different ways you can formulate it. I mean, uh, you know, a, a slightly more precise way of putting it, which is to say that um, he thinks it's growth and development in productive power, and in particular technology very broadly construed, um, that brings about changes in society. And it brings about changes in society through the mechanism of class struggle. So probably his most important contribution to the actual practice of history is to uh, call attention to the role that conflicts between different economic classes, where classes roughly can be defined in terms of what ownership they have or don't have in the existing technologies, in the existing productive power in society, um, how conflicts between classes with different economic interests, given what productive power they own, how those conflicts explain historical developments. Right? Um, and that's the, you know, the, the version of historical materialism uh, that Marx, Marx and Engels characterize in the Communist Manifesto is, say, the history of all society uh, 
Hitherto is the history of you know class struggle, class conflict. Um, now there's a more formal statement of historical materialism that you occasionally get in Marx, and that has attracted a great deal of scholarly commentary, um, in which the focus is on purely on the growth of <clears throat> productive power, and then the argument is that you can sort of look at any society and sort of cut it into three pieces. One part at the highest level is sort of what he calls the ideological superstructure. These are moral, political, philosophical, religious ideas that are characteristic of any epoch. Then there are the relations of production. Uh, that's the middle level, which is um, basically the distribution of property rights. So under capitalism, right, um, most of us have a property right only in one form of productive power, namely our labor power, right? Uh, <clears throat> I sell my labor power to the University of Chicago and God bless them, they pay me well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't really, I mean, I own little bits of Microsoft, you know, thanks to retirement accounts and so on, but I don't really own um, other kinds of productive uh, power in our, in our society. Um, whereas other people, Bill Gates, Right, he owns right massive amounts of productive power in the form of technology, right? Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> so you know, Marx's thought is that depending on, uh, sorry, that's the relations of production. I I shouldn't sidetrack myself here. Um, and then the what's often called the material base is the level of development of productive power in that society. And sometimes historical materialism is characterized as the view that um, the ideological superstructure is explained by the contribution it makes to legitimizing or sustaining the relations of production. And the relations of production are explained by the fact that they facilitate the further development of the existing productive power or technology. Right? Um, and that's the more sort of functionalist gloss on historical materialism that G.A. Cohen um, uh, sort of put to the forefront of, uh, of scholarship on Marx in the late 1970s. And so <clears throat> productive power and technology sound like they really go hand in hand, but they're not the same. Um, they're not entirely the same, right? Because, <clears throat> I mean, human labor power is a kind of productive power. <clears throat> but human labor power has not grown very significantly over history. It's a little greater now than it was 2,000 years ago because people tend to be stronger and bigger <laughs> than they were. Um, the real growth in productive power uh, occurs through the growth in what I'm calling very broadly technology. But technology, you can think of it as any tools that, um, that people are using to increase uh, what they can produce given various... Uh, natural resources, right? So, you know, early developments in technology were, you know, s simple things like um, the bow and arrow, right? That was an important technological development. Spears, good technological development. Guds, oh boy, that was a big technological development. But nothing like the growth in technology that occurred starting with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, right? This was an extraordinary transformation, right? So the development of the power loom, right? Uh, which is a machine, right, that can weave cloth um, and a couple of people can run a power loom and produce more cloth than hundreds of individual weavers could produce given the same amount of time. Um, you know, steam power, water power, then coal power, right? All of these developments increased productive power quite dramatically. Um, and the computer revolution has done something um, has done something similar, as well as you know various other you know technological developments just over the just over the last fifty years. So the productive power of humanity between 1750 and 1850, you know, increased more dramatically more than it had in the prior four or five thousand years. Right? Um, and this is the point, of course, at which Marx comes on the scene in the mid 19th century as witness to this, uh, these dramatic transformations brought on by the, by the industrial revolution and the rise of modern capitalism. And part of Marx's thought, which I think is correct, is that capitalist relations of production, 
That is where you have some people who own technology and who invest money solely to get more money out of the system, right? Profit. That um, that way of organizing economic production was particularly good at developing technolog technology and productive power. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, and I think he was right about this. Right, that uh, capitalism is remarkably good um, at developing productive power and in particular in developing new new technologies because um, capitalists basically live or die on their ability to do that. Right? This is why they're so good at it is because their existence depends on it, uh, to put it a little too simply. But that is, I, I think, the core part of Marx's observation. And... My guess is that it's in the interest of those who own or control the means of production to improve the technology, to increase their own productive power. But then at the same time, it's probably likely not in the interest of the laborer because then their labor becomes less valuable. Right. So the the interest of the cap, the capitalists have only one interest, which is profit. Right. And so increasing productive power is potentially a way to increase profit. Okay. Um, now it gets complicated because if any one capitalist, you know, embraces a technological innovation, which allows him to produce more commodities with the same amount of labor time, for example, right? and thus increase their, their profit margin, initially that capitalist will have an advantage over his or her competitors. But then, of course, all the other capitalists will invest in the same technology. Right? Um, and so then the whole thing starts starts over again. But but I think the, the key thing to emphasize is that capitalists have no interest in increasing their productive power per se. They have only one interest, which is profit. Right? And now how can they get profit? Well, they can pay their workers less. They can make them right, work more. Right? Um, or they can reduce their overall costs. And one way to reduce overall costs, and in particular to reduce labor costs, human labor costs, is to substitute technology for human labor power, which is the sense in which capitalism ultimately becomes a problem for those who have only one thing to sell, which is their, which is their labor power. And the incentive structure of capitalism is such that this is exactly what capitalists are always trying to do. And we've been seeing it, you know, in, in our own world in, you know, little bits and pieces, right? I mean, you're, you're younger than me, but you're old enough to remember when most stores had cashiers, right? Um, yes. Yeah. And now you go into the CVS or the Walgreens or whatever, and <laughs> there's still some staff, right? But now people are checking themselves out with those little scanners, you know, and, and so on. Right? That's a little technological innovation that it was displacing human labor power. Uh, driverless vehicles, you know, driverless trucks, they're in development. Probably within the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to start seeing a lot of them. Um, there are 3 million people in the United States who drive trucks, roughly. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a low skill job. You can sell your labor power to drive a truck without having gone to college. Right? Um, and all those jobs are going to disappear. Um, you know, those are little examples of what, what the broader development is. You know, chat GPT has just arrived on the scene. You know, mm -hmm. right now there's a lot of hysteria about it, and it's, it's not very good at anything that's remotely complicated. Um, and there's a lawyer in New York who just learned you can't have chat GPT write your brief for you because chat GPT just makes up cases. And it doesn't just make up cases, it makes up citations to the cases, it makes up quotes, right? Because it, it doesn't think, right? It's just, you know, mm -hmm. surveying this massive database and making predictions about what words should come next. Um, but still, right, uh, it is an example, artificial intelligence is an example of something that um, displaces human labor power, right? You know, when I was growing up, uh, whenever they wanted to collect tolls on the highway, there was only one way to do it. They had to have a toll booth and there had to be a person there who took your money and let you get through. Those have almost completely disappeared, right? Now we mm -hmm. have, you know, uh, those little cameras or whatever that pick up your, you have your little box on the front window shield, 
right? Those are the kind of things that are, are visible that are happening. Um, but, you know, then there's also what's going on in the context of industrial production, right? And has been going on, you know, for now 50 years or so, where um, machines replace various work that, uh, that human laborers used to do on assembly lines, you know, um, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a big part of why, you know, Marx shares with Milton Friedman, as I like to point out to people, especially around here. <laughs> Marx shares with, you know, Milton Friedman, right, a, a number of ideas, including that capitalism is remarkably good at developing technology and productive capacity, right? All those things the Chicago School believes about economics and about capitalism in that regard are probably correct. Marx agrees with Milton Friedman that the corporation has only one purpose, which is to pursue profit. Right? Milton Friedman uh, was criticized quite extensively for that, which is, as it were, typical of the ideology of the mainstream media, because all he was observing is the basic fact of how a capitalist system works. Right? A corporation that doesn't pursue profit will cease to exist. Full stop. Um, you know, so he agrees with, you know, Milton Friedman on a lot of these kinds of issues. Um, but what the people like Milton Friedman in the Chicago School don't understand is they don't understand that the entire logic of how capitalism operates is eventually going to be bad news for 95% of the human beings on the planet Earth, <laughs> because mm -hmm. most people have only their labor power to sell. And capitalists have are in endless competition with each other to reduce their costs and increase their profit margins, which means they have a continual incentive to get rid of human labor powers and expense in favor of technology when technology is cheaper, which it almost always is over the long haul. So in that sense, things can only end badly. Right? Um, and, you know, now Marx was a, a very optimistic fellow. Um, you know, Hegel was an optimistic fellow, but he had the excuse of being a Christian. <laughs> and uh, But Marx was not, you know, was, was an atheistic thinker. But Marx, Marx remained optimistic that capitalism would necessarily self-destruct. And while capitalism may ultimately self-destruct, it's not clear that it, it has to end in a better state of affairs. And as we quote in the book, and you may remember, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg, who uh, was a Marxist political activist and theoretician in the early 20th century, you know, she said the ultimate choice is going to be between socialism and barbarism, right? by which she meant the following, which is when we get to a point where the productive power produced by capitalism is so great that we could actually produce most things that people need or all things that people need and maybe a lot of things people want. But if that productive power is entirely in the hands of capitalists who want to utilize it only for profit, we're going to have a problem, right? And um, either we're going to have socialism, that is where productive power is socially owned and used to meet social needs, or we're going to have barbarism, that is where the capitalist class uses brute force to protect its control of productive power and, um, and the rest of humanity be damned. Um, and sad to say, I think that diagnosis was probably correct, right? Mm. I mean, you know, in some places we're veering towards barbarism, the United States. Uh, we haven't quite gotten there yet, thankfully, but give it another 25 years <laughs> mm. or 50 years. Uh, and, you know, in other places, they're veering a little more towards something like socialism, but uh, it's, it's very un uncertain how this is going to play out. Um, but, uh, you know, I won't be here in 100 years. You may be. <laughs> Maybe. And uh, I wish you luck. Yeah. <laughs> I vote for have... socialism over barbarism. Mm -hmm. um, well, a, a few <laughs> things uh, in response to what you just said. One, I hadn't heard about this New York lawyer using chat GPT to write his brief. And that's very funny. Uh, it, it was in the New York times just a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then <coughs> just a, a, a point of clarification. Yeah. When, when you say that the capitalist has only one interest profit, are you speaking as Brian, the possible Marxist or just as 
an exegesis of Marx's views and characterizing the archetype of the capitalist? Well, it was it was more the latter, but I, I do think okay. it's, it's a correct assessment, right? Okay. That is, the capitalist qua capitalist has only one interest. Now, an individual capitalist, you know, may be interested in poetry on the side or whatever. That's not right. the point. But as a capitalist, what it means to be a capitalist means that you lay out money, you invest money in you know, raw materials, in labor power, in technology, in order to sell those commodities and get more money out of the, the whole process. That's the entire raison d'etre of the whole thing, right? It's not a charitable organization. It's not there to promote social justice, right? Or environmental well-being. To the extent those affect consumer behavior, capitalists can get interested in them. That's partly what we're seeing now in some sectors. But that's only because it proves to be profitable. Because the basic right. rule of capitalism is if you're not producing a profit, right, um, then you're going to be put out of business right, by your competitors, right? your competitor capitalists. Right? I mean, if I decide, you know, if I decide I'm a capitalist, but I'm a very nice guy, hey, I'm a nice guy. Right? But I don't know if I'd survive being a nice guy if I were a capitalist. But if, you know, if I'm a good hearted capitalist and I say, geez, my workers really should get paid a lot more money. You know? And so I'm going to pay them a lot more money with the result that my profit margin goes way down. Or no, I don't want my profit margin to go down that much. So I raise the prices on my commodities. But then all the other capitalists who aren't so nice, they're not going to do that. And so they'll, you know, sell their commodities for less than I sell mine because I'm a little too good to my employees. And the result will be that I'll ultimately go out of business. Yeah? That's how capitalism works. Right? You know, unless all the capitalists miraculously all became good hearted in the same way, or unless they are forced by state power right, to all pay their workers more, for example. Right? Uh, any one capitalist who tries to, who undercuts their own profit margins is going to get destroyed in the market. That's how it works. Right? And pretending otherwise, you know, which even the critics of Milton Friedman wanted to do is, is in a way just childish. And so I, so I do think Marx has diagnosed this completely correctly, but so did Milton Friedman, ironically enough. Right. They both saw that this is, uh, you know, Friedman put it as though, you know, Friedman said the only thing the cap, uh, corporation should care about is profit. Right? But it's not really a normative judgment. Right? It's a descriptive one. It's a descriptive claim, which is that any corporation that doesn't keep an eye on profit is going to cease to exist at some point in the future. You know? And that's the logic. That's the nature of capitalism. Uh, if that's not true, then it's not capitalism. We've got some other economic system <laughs> going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is exactly what I was going to ask you about. I was going to ask you about whether or not a... Marxist analyzes the current preoccupation with social justice type issues or implicit endorsements of the same in the corporate world. Like I had Dylan Mulvaney and uh, Budweiser in mind. Do, does the Marxist interpret this or analyze this as like cynical behavior in the pursuit of profit? And it sounds like, yeah, yes. I, 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 I'm not sure I want to use the word cynical. Um, well, uh, uh, analyzes it cynically. I mean, they, they think that the person is doing it based on yeah. uh, so self-interest. If, if that's what you mean by cynical, okay. But, you know, Marx is generally not big on comments on, on, on motives. Um, uh, I mean, if capitalists, um, you know, sign on to uh diversity you know uh it's because they think it's good for business and indeed that's how diversity was first promoted in the 1970s uh oh really uh, yeah the uh oh, this is worth commenting on if you, if you <laughs> didn't know this no 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 definitely <laughs> the i mean the, the original rationale for affirmative action you know which started with president kennedy was pretty simple which is the united states you know half the united states was a de jure apartheid state and the other half of the United States was a de facto apartheid state, right, to the disadvantage of blacks. Okay? And Kennedy and then Johnson after him, they came along and they said, look, this has got to end. We're going to change the law. Right. And we've got to try to make up, compensate, you know, for two centuries or more 
of abuse and degradation of this, you know, entire segment of the population based on their race. Right? So we're going to have preferences for blacks and jobs and admissions and, and so on. Right. Because they are starting from a place well beyond, well behind um, any of the whites they're, they're competing with. And that became very unpopular very quickly as part of the general backlash to the civil rights revolution in the 1960s in America. Um, and corporate America actually came up with the idea that, well, no, um, affirmative action isn't about justice for black people, right? which is what it was really about. Right. You know, there's been this grotesque injustice, and now we're going to try to rectify it in some measure. They said, no, no, that's not what it's about. What it's about is promoting diversity, and diversity is good for business. With the workforce is better, works better. It's just, it's better for business if we have a diverse workforce. And that's where diversity came from, and then it got constitutionalized by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, and to this day, right, corporate America is on board with that. Now, if you ask why did corporate America get on board with this, one possibility is, of course, they were moved by a sense of racial justice. And that doesn't seem to be the explanation. Um, that maybe is what you're referring to as the cynical part. Uh, the simpler explanation, which is almost surely the correct explanation, is that they did discover that diversity was good for business. Right? Um, because one, one effect of the end of apartheid in America, together with the uh, affirmative action, is very large numbers of black people suddenly became consumers with money, right? They mm -hmm. became middle class, upper middle class, even upper class, right? In much greater numbers than prior to the, the civil rights revolution and prior to, to affirmative action. And so indeed, there was a way in which it became now good for business. Um, and of course, as the United States has become more racially and ethnically diverse, the diversity, you know, uh, you know, ideology uh, is helpful on many fronts. You've got your Asian American consumers, right? You've got your Hispanic consumers, and so on. Um, so, you know, that I think is why it's triumphed. Um, you know, or you know, in in the wake of the murder of George Floyd by that sadistic police officer in uh, in, in Minneapolis, right? I mean, corporate America really took that one up, right, big time. Okay? Now, the, the curious thing about the murder of George Floyd is um, he he fit two different relevant demographics, only one of which got any attention. One demographic was he was black. <laughs> the other demographic was that um, he was poor and economically marginalized. And um, it turns out that uh, police killings, um, you know, who do police kill? It turns out they kill overwhelmingly the poor and the economically marginal. They also kill a disproportionate number of blacks, but they actually kill them in proportion to their being poor and economically marginal. Right? That part of the narrative of what happened to George Floyd was lost, and it became entirely the, the race issue, right? And it's easy for corporate America to get on board that because it's consistent with their, you know, uh, the diversity stuff that they've been embracing for 40 or 50 years. Right. Um, if instead the murder of George Floyd had been framed as yet another poor person who's a victim of police violence, and those are the main victims of police violence, corporate America wouldn't have been so thrilled with that because, um, you know, it would be quite easy to eliminate poverty, but it would be difficult to do so consistent with the pursuit of profit. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way, right? So the race narrative is much more appealing than the, than the poverty um, narrative. And that's the one that rises to, you know, that comes to dominate the public ideology and the discussion of this incident, right? And so, you know, you get some Ibram Kendi, right? You know, who's a world-class race grifter, <laughs> as they say. You know, I mean, corporate America loves him, right? Because nothing he says is at all threatening to corporate America, right? Nothing he says. The, corporate America is not so fond of Bernie Sanders <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because Bernie Sanders cuts a little uh, closer to the essence, which is that uh, the pursuit of profit would be harder in Bernie Sanders' world. In Ibram Kennedy's world, it's easy as you can be. All you have to do is make sure you have a certain number of black people on your corporate board. No problem. Right? Then you've you've done your so-called anti-racist effort, and you can keep uh, you can keep extracting profit from the system.
Well, I definitely can't say that I'm a Marxist because I just read about Marx for the first time a couple of days ago. <laughs> uh, but it is quite striking that diversity entered the socio-cultural zeitgeist in the interest of those who own the means of production. Uh, but most people are probably familiar with the term ideology, probably in the sense in which you just mentioned diversity yeah. ideology as some sort of constellation of beliefs and ideas that might be espoused by a group of people. But until you lectured at, at Stanford a month or two ago, I'd actually never heard it used in this Marxist context. So you, you already referenced the ideological superstructure, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper into what ideology is for Marx and mm -hmm. how it relates to historical materialism. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I mean, one distinctive feature of the way Marx uses the term is that it's always used uh, pejoratively. That is, um, okay. he doesn't use it in a neutral or merely descriptive sense. Some later Marxists actually do adopt neutral descriptive senses of ideology. And of course, you know, um, other social scientists sometimes use ideology in a purely descriptive or neutral sense. For Marx, it's always pejorative. Ideologies always involve some beliefs um, that are false, right? But it's not just that um, ideologies involve false beliefs. They involve mistakes of a certain kind. Um, they involve mistakes in which people, um, in which the mistake is actually adverse to the interests of the person who accepts the ideology, right? And that's the kind of peculiar feature of ideologies for Marx, right? People believe things that are false, and the false beliefs they have are actually not in their interest, and yet still they believe it, you know? Um, so to take uh, one of uh, Marx's favorite bogeymen, um, the Reverend Thomas Malthus, um, who uh, argued that... Um, uh, you know, it was necessary that there be, as it were, uh, an elite aristocratic class that lived in luxury, right? Because those people, right, um, were consumers of luxury goods and consumption of luxury goods was the motor of the whole economy. So his first claim was if you abolished, you know, the aristocracy, the whole economy would collapse, everyone would be worse off, you know? And his second claim was, and this is the one he's more notorious for more generally, was that if, uh, if in fact you tried to redistribute some of the wealth from the aristocracy to, you know, the paupers, to the peasants, to the impoverished, you know, working classes in, uh, in the urban ghettos, um, the effect of that is that those people would start having many more children and society wouldn't, we'd have overpopulation and the economy would again collapse. <laughs> So those were his two sets of, of arguments. Both were completely preposterous, right? They're both false, right? It is not true that the consumption of luxury goods is the motor of the economy. It is not true that redistribution of wealth would have produced overpopulation that would have caused the economy to collapse, you know? Uh, but many people believe these things. Many people believe these things, even though it wasn't in their interest. Now, of course, it was in the interests of the aristocracy to believe this nonsense. But it wasn't in the interests of, you know, the peasants and the poor to believe it, right? Um, in the sense that they would have been better off if they were able to bring about revolutionary change to the way society was, was organized. Um, because in point of fact, they would have had more food, better housing, more money, more leisure, and so on, if there had been a redistribution of wealth uh, and if productive power had been, had been used differently. So in that sense, they were making a rather fundamental mistake about what was ultimately in their interest, and yet they believed it nonetheless, right? And that is, that's the core puzzle for Marx. Why do people believe these things that are false, but not just false, their falsity is actually adverse to their own real interests. Right? Um, and this is where the question that, that Jamie Edwards takes up yeah, in yeah. his dissertation comes in, right? which is, <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, why do people make these kinds of mistakes? Why do people make these kinds of mistakes? 
And what Jamie did is, um, you know, he, you know, the post Tversky and Kahneman, right? We now have an enormous psychological literature about, um, you could say it's human irrationality. You could say it's the foibles or the inbuilt biases of human reasoning. Right? And what he shows is that there's a lot of psychological literature that, as it were, explains why this kind of mistake should be as common as it is. So, for example, and I didn't know this until, uh, you know, I learned this from Jamie's dissertation. Um, you know, there is a, a well-documented sort of just world and status quo bias. That is, people like to think that the world in which they live is okay. Right? It's not just. the conspiracy theorists. <laughs> well, not conspiracy theorists, not so much, right? But they're mm -hmm. they're fruitcakes, right? Um, mm -hmm. Most people, right? They're generally fruitcakes. So we can talk more about conspiracy theories if you want. Um, but most people want to believe that things are fair and just, right? And if that's a fundamental bias in our cognitive mechanisms, you know, that's wonderful for ideology, right? <laughs> because Thomas Malthus tells us, yes, you're living in a hovel. Yes, you don't have enough food to eat. Yes, you work 70 hours a week, but it couldn't be otherwise. That's the way it has to be, right? So it's a little hard on you. We admit it, but it couldn't be otherwise, right? Um, and there's a lot of psychological mechanisms, as it were, that, uh, you know, bias things in the favor of an ideology that rationalizes the status quo, right? Um, yeah. and, and I think this is an important, you know, contribution that uh, Jamie's made here because, you know, one kind of, uh, you know, pretty superficial objection people make to Marx is, well, why should you think people make these kinds of mistakes, right? You know, that's condescending, right, that you think people are making these mistakes. Now, the first thing to observe is that people make mistakes all the time. You know, I mean, in fact, most of what most people believe is false, right? Most people have religious beliefs. Religious beliefs have an interesting attribute. They're all false. Right? Um, you know, <laughs> this may cost that you a few viewers, attribute. right? But I, you know, I don't, I don't like to pussyfoot around on that particular issue. I mean, it's it's kind of embarrassing in a way that um, that there's now you know these whole industries, even in philosophy, trying to rationalize um, religious belief. But false belief does seem to be characteristic of the human condition, right? Now, but the, the slightly stronger form of the challenge is to say, okay, maybe people believe a lot of things are false, but why would you think people are prone to believe things that are false that are actually not even in their interest, that are harmful to them? Why would they make that kind of mistake? And this is where the cognitive psychology literature, I think, is very helpful. It says, actually, there's all kinds of irrationalities and biases in human thinking that are very conducive to making mistakes precisely in the direction that 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 Marx has identified. And then you add to that the fact, as Marx himself observed, that the ruling class tends to control the main forms of you know, mental production, the main forms by which ideas are disseminated. Right? The internet's made a small dent in that, but not a very big one. Um, you know, Rupert Murdoch is a billionaire. He controls Fox News. Right? Fox News has a particularly clear ideological bias. Right? But CNN was owned by another billionaire. Um, it wasn't, uh, it didn't have the same ideological biases at Fox, but it had clear ideological biases. The New York Times, right, is owned by a private family that's a member of the, the ruling class, the Salzburg family, right? Um, you know, uh, and the Salzburger family made sure the New York Times had a very clear ideology, right? I mean, one of the weirdest things for me in the last 25 years with the rise of the Internet is to discover there are all these morons out there who think the crucial thing about the New York Times is it's got a, you know, a left wing bias. It doesn't have a left wing bias. It's got a socially liberal bias. Right. It's not very sympathetic to the kinds of you know, prejudices that, uh, you know, reactionary religious people tend to have. That's true. But it doesn't have a left wing bias. Right. Uh, and all you have to do is look at the history of New York Times. You see that's clear as day. New York Times, for example, is a huge supporter of the Vietnam War for a long time. I think people don't realize that, you know, if they didn't live through it or if they, they don't know the history. Um, you know, New York Times 
you know, went out of its way to torpedo Bernie Sanders both times he was running for president. Right? They would run these really scandalous hit pieces on a regular basis. Why? Because he was not, you know, simpatico with the ideology of, uh, of, of the capitalist class, or as I like to say, the prudent wing of the capitalist class. The Democrats are the prudent wing of the capitalist class in the sense that they, they realize without some redistribution and a certain amount of the welfare state, the whole thing will blow up. The Republicans, you know, who, of course, have gone crazy over the last 40 years, um, you know, they are the imprudent wing of the ruling class. <laughs> They, they didn't learn the lessons of the 1930s the way Franklin Roosevelt did when he was accused of being a traitor to his class, which is Roosevelt saw, you know, there were two options on the horizon, fascism and, you know, and Soviet communism. And he decided social democracy uh, was the way to, you know, preserve the capitalist system. He was quite explicit about it, actually. When, when accused of being a traitor to his class, he was actually the first prudent member of the... Uh, of the ruling class in the United States who had real political power. Well, you mentioned, I mean, this is very interesting to me, this discussion of the the Salzburgers in the New York Times. Did Marx write much about the owners of production also controlling the means of disseminating information? Um, he, he didn't write a lot, but he did write some about it. I mean, he okay. did, there is a very famous line, you know, where he explains the dominance of ruling class ideas by the fact that the ruling class owns the means of mental production is, is how okay. he characterized. Now, of course, you know, then the, the primary means of disseminating ideas, well, there were the churches, right? Mm -hmm. um, which the, of course, the ruling class didn't exactly own them, but they sort of did, right? You know, um, that is, they had an enormous amount of influence with them in terms of, you know, providing funds and so on. And then there would have been, you know, newspapers. Um, you know, in the 19th century, there were also like, you know, broadsheets and pamphlets that people would hand out. That was that was their version of the internet, right? That that was less subject to, you know, control, but it rarely could have as much impact, right? As um, as you know, as the major newspapers. Um, now we still have the major newspapers, though there are fewer and fewer, right? I mean. The New York Times, in a way, is even more influential now than it was 30 years ago because the Internet has, you know, destroyed so many other newspapers in, um, over the last generation. Um, but, you know, then we've got, you know, we've got Fox, we've got CNN, we've got MSNBC, which is sort of a liberal Fox, right? Um, uh, you know, so television has become, as well as online television has become, you know, I think the major way in which um, ideology gets uh, gets disseminated. Um, and then in recent years, of course, we've seen in, in Republican controlled states, um, you know, very explicit efforts, right, to uh, promote certain kinds of ideological indoctrination in the lower schools, even in the university, right? um, you know, not to talk about certain things, um, you know. I was just, I had an email recently from someone who teaches Marx occasionally at a public university in Florida, right? And um, it is unclear to them whether, consistent with the new Florida law, they can continue to teach Marx uh, in, uh, in their introductory sort of general education philosophy classes. Um, that's, of course, the goal of the legislature, right? Um, but it's really, you know, it's really... Uh, pretty dramatic and it obviously puts a lie to you know the idea that these people are the champions of free speech and free inquiry they're obviously not they're fascists right and like all fascists they do not want marx taught <laughs> um mm -hmm. so yeah i <clears throat> imagined that writing about things like well obviously the new york times but newspapers might not have been such a major topic for marx just because i i don't know how big newspapers were at the time but boy would he have had a lot to say with regard to the internet and uh television news uh I, yeah i mean I, I think that's right i mean i i should mention right marx actually did a lot of writing for newspapers um it's you know it's it's one way in which he earned money he used to write columns for the new york herald tribune i think it was which was one of the major new york you know papers um and uh 
I think it's it's partly where he sort of honed and developed his somewhat polemical style, you know, in having to write, you know, 600 words about the, the issues of issues of the day. And of course, he also, you know, wrote for various newspapers um, in Germany early on in, in his career, though, um, you know, they tended to get closed down by the censors, so, which is one reason he had to move around a lot. Um, you know, it's worth keeping in mind. I, I think, you know, professors these days don't generally change countries because the police are coming. Uh, but Marx had to change countries a lot because the police were coming. Um, mm. And then he eventually landed in England and was supported by his his frequent co-author, Friedrich Engels, uh, who was heir to an industrial fortune. Um, Engels, uh Engels wrote a book about the uh, the living conditions of the working class in Manchester, where one of the Engels factories was. Well, I have one last question about ideology, and it's just to make sure that I understand at least one nuance of the term. But you said at the outset of your response about ideology that Marx always uses ideology in a pejorative sense. And I'm wondering if, by definition, there would be no ideology at all in a Marxist utopia where the workers own the means of production, because I would have just, on the face of it, imagined that ideology would not be used pejoratively in that sense, but that's maybe the, maybe because there would be no ideology. If in a post-capitalist society... Um there uh, there were no economic classes, then there would be no ideology in Marxist sense. Right? Um, people would not have to believe things that involve mistakes about their interests because in a classless society, people's interests, or so Marx thought, um, would be met right? because productive power would be utilized, <coughs> would be controlled socially so that everyone's you know, interests were, were satisfied. Now, it is certainly true that um, in a communist society, as Marx thought about it, there might be ideologies in the descriptive sense, in the sense that there were widely shared beliefs, for example, um, about morality, um, about you know what was worthwhile, um, and uh, <clears throat> and so on. So there might be the ideology in that descriptive sense, but ideology in the pejorative sense that Marx uses is a feature of <laughs> societies marked by class division. Um, whether those are the you know, capitalist class and the proletariat, the laboring class of the 19th century, whether it's the Roman aristocracy and, you know, and the slaves, what, whatever society it is, there is a class structure and ideology performs its, its, its pernicious purpose in those um, in those societies. Take away classes, no no role for ideology, no need for it. Then the last question that I have is, do you think that historical materialism, as we've been describing it, is a true theory? <laughs> Good. Yes. Well, that's certainly a fair question. Um, so, uh, You know, I think the answer has to be no, um, but but th there's a lot of qualifications on that. Um, I think it's a better and more plausible and more successful theory of historical change than any other theory of historical change. Um, but there are no fully successful theories of historical change and evolution um, because history is complex and people are complex. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, and. The other difficulty is you can find examples of historical developments um, that seem inconsistent with what the theory of historical materialism would would predict. Right? So you can find cases where um, instead of <coughs> productive power continuing to grow, there's actually regress. That is, productive power becomes less over time, right? Um, which is not something you would expect from historical materialism. Uh, I think one of the best examples um, of a historical event inconsistent with historical materialism uh, was uh, what Stalin did when, uh, you know, when he consolidated power in the 1920s in the Soviet Union. 
And remember, when, when the Russian Revolution occurred in 1917, Russia was essentially an agricultural society, right? I mean, they had peasants, they had quasi-serfs still, even though serfdom had been abolished in the late 19th century. Um, and, you know, on Marxist terms, you would have predicted that what they most needed were capitalist relations of production in order to develop their productive power. <clears throat> but what Stalin showed is that Stalin made the Soviet Union a major industrial power without capitalism, right? Now he did it in a way Marx never could have anticipated, namely with, you know, tyranny and, you know, state terror, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out you can increase productive power if you're tyrannical enough without you utilizing capitalism. Uh, but again, that isn't something you would have expected, you know, uh, given his general picture of uh, how history is supposed to work. Um, on the other hand, there's no question, and you know, there's an enormous literature by historians now that utilizes the class conflict framework to understand right, different historical periods and to do so, you know, with very good effect. Uh, now, you know, there's a, there's a larger issue looming here as to whether we think historical explanations are genuine explanations. You know, some people are skeptical, think they're all make-believe or whatever. We'll have to put the skeptics to one side. If you think there are better and worse historical explanations, as I'm inclined to think, then uh, historical materialism provides a framework for some very powerful explanations of a lot of historical phenomena. Um, but there are no exceptionalist laws in history, just as there are probably no exceptionalist laws in, in psychology uh, either. So in that sense, um, it is not strictly speaking um, true as applied to, you know, all historical events. There are some historical events that just don't fit. And I think that's the fairest thing one has to say. One term that hasn't come up yet that I know is very important for Marx, and I'm not thinking of alienation yet, but we'll get to that maybe another time. But I wanted to ask a bit about what exploitation means for Marx and how it figures into what we've been talking about. Good. Okay, so exploitation is uh, an important concept in, in Marx's, you know, final major work, um, Capital. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, exploitation is, you know, he has both a kind of polemical use for it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's exploitation is theft, something like that. Um but I think, you know, strictly speaking, it's it's a purely technical notion for Marx. Um, and it's how we explain how the capitalist is able to uh, uh, extract profit from the productive enterprise. Now, the problem with the technical notion of exploitation, which I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the details in a second, um, is that it does depend upon the labor theory of value. Um, now, there is an industry of, uh, you know, readers of capital, you know, who are like readers of the Talmud. You know, they they detect things that nobody else has ever noticed. And, and they think that, in fact, Marx isn't committed to the labor theory of value or the labor theory of value doesn't mean what people thought it meant and, and so on. We don't engage very extensively with this literature. Michael Heinrich is probably the... the the strongest uh, example of this. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Marx accepted the classical labor theory of value, that you, s s Adam Smith kind of suggests it, but it's not clear he really held it. David Ricardo, another English economist uh, who's very important for Marx, clearly held the labor theory of value. Um, and the labor theory of value, very crudely put, suggested that the price of commodities, right, stands in some important explanatory relationship to the amount of human labor required to produce the commodity. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, and Marx refined this notion in, what, in a number of ways going beyond Ricardo. So Marx said, what we need to think about is, um, uh, is it were abstract human labor that is abstracted away from uh, the particular amount of labor required, you know, to produce this product or that product. He said we need to think in terms of, as it were, the average labor time, right? Because some workers are more efficient than others and so on. Uh, 
Um, but he did think that the, you know, the so, as he put it, the socially necessary labor time to produce a commodity would explain what Marx called the production price of the commodity. The production price of the commodity is not the price on the market. Marx understood as well as any neoclassical economist that the production price, that the commodity price on the market could be affected by a lot of variables, including supply and demand. The production price was a kind of technical notion for Marx. The production price was um, determined by figuring out the socially necessary labor time to produce the commodity, including the socially necessary labor time required to produce the technology that was used to produce the commodity, right? Um, plus the rate of profit, right? Or the rate of exploitation. This is what gets us back to exploitation. And Marx spent a lot of the third volume of Capital trying to show that he could make this work, and he didn't succeed. And I think everybody agrees with, 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 the, with a few exceptions. Most people agree he didn't actually succeed in, in, in explaining this. Now, exploitation. All right, so we've got the labor theory of value in the background. So according to Marx, exploitation operates as follows. Um, uh, the worker, right, the labor power of the worker is itself a commodity. Right? And therefore, the price of the commodity is determined by the socially necessary labor time to produce that labor power. Right? So we can put a price on, as it were, how much, right? Uh, that labor power is is worth, right? So we've got a factor in, you know, the worker needs to eat, the worker needs shelter. Um, the worker also needs to reproduce because capitalists need future workers and, and so on. I'm alighting some, a lot of technical details here just for the simple mm -hmm. idea. So the labor theory of value tells us um, how much it costs to produce the labor power that the worker sells to the capitalist. Okay? Um, and the labor power right, that, um, that the capitalist purchases um, can be used for whatever amount of time the capitalist purchases it for, let's say 12 hours. Right? But if uh, it only takes six hours of labor time to produce the value of the labor power right, that the capitalist bought, then that additional six hours of labor, right, which adds value to the commodity produced, right, that becomes the product, that becomes the property of the, of the capitalist, right? That is the surplus right, value that the laborer produces. The laborer works for six hours to produce the value of their own labor power, given the labor theory of value, but then works another six hours adding value to the commodities that are produced and doesn't get paid for that at all. That's the sense in which exploitation is theft, right? The worker works more time than they're actually paid for. Okay? Um, and it's that extra labor time that produces the extra value that is the source of all profit. That's Marx's view, given the, the labor theory of value. Now, the problem is if the labor theory of value is wrong, right, as it almost certainly is, with apologies to, uh, <laughs> to the Michael Heinrich followers out there. Um, if the labor theory of value is not plausible, then we could have other explanations for the, you know, the source of profit, right? So, you know, at the time Marx is writing Capital, the sort of marginalist revolution in economics is occurring at the same time, but he's totally unaware of it, right? And the marginalist revolution says... Um, it's the marginal utility that consumers get from a product that determines the price of the product, right? And so you make a profit if you produce things um, that are useful for people, right? That uh, satisfy their marginal utility such that they're willing to pay for, right? And that's all there is to it. You know? Again, slight simplification, but that's the, that's the basic idea. Um, and uh, so if that's right, then... Uh, then Marx's explanation of exploitation um, doesn't work. Okay? On the other hand, I still think, you know, there's, there is the colloquial sense of exploitation, the more polemical sense, you know, that still has some, you know, applicability, right? I mean, look, the fact is that, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you go to the Ford, you know, you know uh, auto plant, right, 
the workers there are getting paid a fixed wage, but the products that are sold are generating profit, including for people who don't do any work, right? People who, you know, are basically, you know, own Ford stock or own the company and are just sitting on their ass. <laughs> um, that's a colloquial sense in which they're being exploited. They're producing value that they're not being paid for. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, all the children of the, the Walton children, right? Heirs to the Walmart fortune, right? These people are worth billions of dollars, right? They don't do anything. But they wouldn't be worth a dime if people weren't wa working in Walmart stores and working in the Walmart warehouses and so on and so forth. Okay. So it's natural in those contexts to, you know, you can sort of get some sense of why you might say, well, they're being e exploited. Um, but I actually I do think that the notion of exploitation, um, as Marx uses it, is dependent on the labor theory of value. And I don't think um, his notion of it survives uh, rejecting. The, um, the the labor theory of value, but I also don't think that's much of a loss to Marx's theory, you know? because um, however profit is generated, Marx is clearly right that capitalists live to acquire profit, right? And he's absolutely right that the incentive structure that creates for capitalists is one in which they want to reduce their labor costs as much as possible, which means the ultimate endpoint for capitalism is one in which capitalists utilize very little human labor power. And that's a disaster for humanity. Right? Mm. So all those aspects of his, uh, I think, of his view um, of, of, of capitalism actually don't depend on either the labor theory of value or his particular theory of, of exploitation. Okay. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. And to finish for today, I mean, granted, for instance, that Marx's technical use of exploitation might not work, or that there are some concerns about whether historical materialism is a true theory, even if it's the most plausible theory we have on your view. To what extent or in what sense, or are you at all even a Marxist? Right. Okay. So in my general, what I generally find is that um, people who are very concerned with self-identifying as Marxists don't think that I am, and that's fine with me. I really don't care. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think one has to allow that, you know, Marx was a genius, but he was a human being and he was a creature of his times and he made certain mistakes and, you know, in various things, that's fine. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the claims he makes that I think are true and are still very important, right, are that a class conflict in his sense of class conflict is an important factor in historical change, right? Um, and it is an important thing to take into account in thinking about any society. Marx is clearly right that the ruling ideas in every society are the ideas of the ruling class, and th those need to be exposed as such. Um, and Marx is, as far as I can see, clearly correct that the logic of capitalism uh, promises a very bad endpoint for the vast majority of humanity, right? Because of the way that capitalism is set up to work, right? Um, that I've, you know, well, we've touched on this a couple of times already. And in, but in this regard, I think Rosa Luxemburg uh, gets it more right than, than Marx, because Marx seemed to think that capitalism would necessarily fall apart, right? Um, and be replaced by communism. Whereas I think Rosa Luxemburg is correct that there are actually two options at the point at which capitalism has eliminated the need for most human labor power. One option would be socialism as collective control of productive power so that human beings can um, be finally free. I, I want to say one thing about what Marx means by freedom, because this is actually quite important. Um, that would be socialism. The other would be barbarism, barbarism where you know, terror and brute force is used um, to keep the vast mass of immiserated people at bay while the capitalist class continues to enjoy the productive power that they they control. Um, but maybe this is the good note to conclude on because freedom probably was the most important ideal for Marx. Right? And this is important to emphasize because, again, in capitalist societies, you know, uh, a lot of ideological energy is invested in smearing Marx as an enemy of freedom. 
Um, but what Marx noticed is that almost everyone in capitalist society is very deeply unfree in the following sense, namely that um, they have to sell their labor power for wages in order to survive, which means most people spend most of their time doing things they would not do except they need to do it to survive. That is, they're coerced. Right? And Marx's ideal of a post-capitalist communist society would be one in which people were free from necessity, as he put it. That is, they were free from the necessity of working simply in order to survive um, so that they could actually express their productive and creative energies in the ways they want to, rather than in the ways they're required to do in order to put food on the, on the table. And, you know, and this is why right, the 19th century saw the elimination of chattel slavery, but it did not see the elimination of wage slavery. And that is a Marxian notion, um, and it's as relevant today as it was in the middle of the of the 19th century, that almost everyone remains um, a wage slave. You know, um, there are degrees of wage slavery <laughs> out there. I'm less of a I, as a wage slave. I am less unfree <laughs> than the people who are cleaning the bathrooms at the university, right? Um, because I. I'm quite confident they would rather not be cleaning the bathrooms, but they need to do it in order to survive. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, capitalist societies are deeply and profoundly unfree. Right? Um, and that is something, of course, uh, Ron DeSantis would not want taught in the public schools in Florida because it's mm -hmm. true and because it is incompatible with the ideology of the class he represents. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, Brian, uh, a podcast is never going to answer every question on some given subject. Uh, but to the extent that this conversation has really gotten me very, very curious about and interested in taking more deep dives into Marx, this has been so Great. successful. So Great. I'm thanks so much for your that. time and talking with me, Brian. Good. Thanks for the invitation to talk about Marx and, uh, and the book, which I hope will be out next year. So thanks a lot. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so. 